So design of experiment, you can say, is used to uh, increase your understanding and gain more knowledge of a system. And the system can be an analytical system. It can be a, a, a small scale uh, investigation all the way up to a full scale production. And more recently, we have also come to associate with the term design of experiments an ambition to uh, investigate how sensitive or insensitive a system or a process or a product is to small fluctuations to changes in critical process parameter. That's also known as design space estimation. And we will also address design space estimation in one of these four uh, webinars. Uh, alternatively, you can say that DOE is applied to almost any kind of problem uh, in, in research development and production that, that relate to development of processes and products or enhancement of existing products and processes. Uh, one very often overarching goal is that of uh, reducing uh, the cost and that can be through increased uh, production, uh, uh, less pollute, pollution being um, uh, sent out through the chimney or uh, released to the nearby river effluent. And it can also be because you're minimizing, let's say, usage of uh, reagents and, and starting materials. The intuitive to experimental work is not DOE. It's something we call cost. And I'm going to use a very small example just to illustrate what we mean by the cost approach to change one separate thing at a time. So this is a very small uh, chemical reaction where you are changing two things and the goal is to find as high yield as possible. And um, the, the things that you can change, we often call factors. And in this case, it is the volume of the reaction container between 500 and 700 milliliters and the pH in the solution, which is varied between 2.5 and 5. And what we measure the result is the yield of the desired product. So in the first stage, then the first factor volume is changed at five settings between the low value and the high value. And for every experiment, you register the yield. And then you can do a scatter graph like this one on the right hand side and quickly find that the best volume seem to be 550 milliliters. Then you decide to carry out a second set of experiments and here you are then locking volume at 550 and you start to change pH instead. And then you, uh, these investigators while using the volume fixed at 550 did six experiments where pH was investigated in incremental steps of 0 0.5 all the way up from 2.5 to 5.0 and these were the yields. And then by scatter graphing it like this, you see that the best pH is 4.5. So you would then lead to think that the combination pH 4.5 and volume 550 would be uh, the best possible combination of pH and volume. But is that really the case? Let's take a, let's take a little overview in, in by using another type of plot of what we have done. So in the beginning, we started by keeping pH at 3 and changing the volume in five steps. After these five experiments, it was concluded that 550 was the best volume. And then we did six experiments changing pH and we found that pH 4.5, experiment number 10 in this series of 11 experiments was the best. Questions we can then ask ourselves, is number 10 really the optimal point? Would there be other directions or other parts of this scatter graph having higher yields? And, and what about the number of experiments? 11 runs, is that high or low? If we take a, a vantage point or bird's eye perspective of what we are doing and visualize what we have done in the real map, we have been told by our 11 experiments that the, the best best condition is around where the arrow is pointing. In the real case, the optimal result is over here. Now having a red laser pointer on a red surface is perhaps not optimal, but I move it around a little so you see. So we have been fooled in some way. We have been misled to perceive that this is the optimum without that necessarily being the case, but the real optimum is, is over here. So what and, and what would happen if we would have started over here by making experiments? We could have ended up in a completely different area of this map. 
So what to do then? If we're not supposed to do cost, what should we do then? Well, what we are recommending is what we call design of experiments. It often su suggests uh, it su suggests a better number of experiments and often fewer than cost. And when you have two factors to change, pH and volume, the DOE protocol takes the shape of a square where you put one experiment in each corner and then optionally add a couple of experiments to represent variation in the inner part of, of this square. When doing these experiments and evaluating results, you will obtain a more reliable model that you can interpret as a navigation tool or as a compass, suggesting to you a better direction in which to move to further improve the result. And the interesting thing is that design of experiments is not locked to two factors. You can use three or five or ten factors. Many factors can be used. In the case of two factors, the basic DOE looks like a rectangle with the four corners populated. If we take the step from two to three factors, then the experimental plans may look like this cube here, where you would do experiments in the corner. And optionally, you could add a couple of uh, additional points, uh, red points located in the middle and green points outside the cube or centered on the faces of the cube. But that, that's more detail that we will come into in the, uh, webinar three. Uh, regardless of whether you're using the left-hand thing or the right-hand thing, the common, the common idea is that by using DOE, you're creating a set of experiments that work together to explore an, an interesting region. And with the, the DOE, you are exploring all factors systematically, and you can also change, uh, uh, sorry, and you can also estimate higher order terms such as interactions. So that's the, that's the whole idea of DOE, to make a series of experiments, and it's perhaps a bit counterintuitive that you have to do all experiments before you can start to evaluate results and get some uh, uh, conclusions done. Uh, and the specific experimental protocol you're doing, either the left one or the right one, is then supporting a certain regression model. And the way the experiments have to be performed is encoded by what we call a worksheet. And in the beginning, the, the response column or the, or the critical quality attribute, as it's commonly known as, is empty. You do the experiments and you evaluate statistically using rigid uh, statistical analysis, and you get the model where the profile of the so-called model coefficients will then indicate how the different critical process parameter combine in influencing the critical quality attribute. And you may also then visualize, visualize results in terms of, for instance, a response surface plot. DOE results in a set of experiments where all factors are varied systematically and, and uh, independently. Uh, and the number and type of factors and the regression model you want to have specify what experiments have to be done. And model then, in terms of a DOE worksheet, defines the optimal number of experiments that you need to do and the best combination of the factors for these experiments. DOE can use, be used for many experimental objectives. Screening optimization, what we will these days call robustness verification, and also system characterization. And the, above all, the most important advantage of DOE compared to cost is that we can estimate all factors and their higher orders in a reliable way, and we're not um, fooled to draw erroneous conclusions.